when I, I teach this class or I taught a class for five years at University of Chicago uh, around entrepreneurship. And on the first day of class, I would ask people why they were there. And, and the, the sort of undercurrent was because I want to be an entrepreneur. And these were MBA students, I believe first semester, second year MBA students. And so then I, I, every time I would say, okay, raise, show of hands. How many of you um, want to be entrepreneurs? Meaning start your own thing and, and be independent of quote unquote, working for someone else, et cetera. And most people raise their hands. And then I said, how many people are interviewing for a job um, right now in the interview process? Everyone raise your hands. And then I just offered the possibility that very similar to um, an artist where an, you say to an artist, are you gonna, who are you? I'm an artist. Do you have a job? Um, maybe, but the job is just so I can do art. The idea of like balancing, should I be, should I work for McKinsey or should I be an entrepreneur? Probably means you're better off working for McKinsey, which brings me back to the answer to your question. Entre, you know, to me, someone who is a who is an entrepreneur, period, ha, is oriented around there being no other choice but keep trying. Like, what else are you going to do? You know, an artist is not going to stop making art because their art wasn't perceived as being attractive. They're going to make art. That's what they do. So an entrepreneur does what they do. In that spirit, the first thing I did after law school uh, that Eric and I as partners were part of was was buying a company, a, a very small company in an industry that I had no idea but now appreciate is a very poor choice for industries to choose, which is clothing, apparel. And the lesson, and so we we bought a company that was doing three or four million dollars in revenue. We grew it fast in our opinion. In my opinion, you know, it, within two years it was twenty million dollars in revenue, not three or four. But that's a hard business because the number of things that have to go right in order to make money are many. You've got to make the stuff. It's got to be the right size and color and it's got to be sold by, we sold to everybody from like Neiman Marcus all the way down to Walmart, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was, it's very, there's so many moving parts in that business. Any one of them goes wrong, it all goes wrong. The lesson there is, choose businesses where more of the more is in your control in terms of the things that must happen in order for it to be successful um and then out of that came the idea for starbelly which was an idea around using technology to facilitate the transaction and 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 supply chain of promotional branded products and it was a very fast growth company it was started in the perfect year, 1998. Um, and we raised $8 million and we soon had an offer for $190 million to sell it, which was then raised to 240. And I found myself at age 29, the president of a New York Stock Exchange company. And little did I know that the company that bought us a year later would be filing bankruptcy. So the lessons of, and I put my, you know, I was, I was, if you will, put out there, or I, you know, as the president, I was on earnings calls when I was 29. Uh, I was the youngest president on the New York Stock Exchange. It looked pretty fun, I would assume, from the outside, or pretty glamorous, let's say. It, materially, there's a lot of glamour or a lot of excitement about that experience. But emotionally and personally, that was about, the, about as confused and, and challenging a situation as I've had in my professional life. And then when, when, when the buyer that bought our company went bankrupt, my net worth, if that's a measure of, of uh, however you perceive the measure of a person's net worth, my net worth went from a lot to almost none. And that's when, you know, the entrepreneur is, is, is ultimately tested. What's next? Well, if you're an entrepreneur, the next is keep trying. Well, you did keep trying, and things got a whole lot better. Echo Logistics, you started uh, in 2005. It went public in 2009. It's worth nearly a billion dollars today. Media Bank, 
which merged with another company. Vista Equity, probably the best private equity firm in the world, bought that company for a little over $700 million. You're feeling good about your future. And, and then comes Groupon. So tell us about Andrew Mace and what he was doing uh, when he approached you with this idea. And then tell us about the point.com. And, and again, I just want to, we're going to try to condense this. I, I know you're, we have a hard stop in a little while, but this is a great story. And there's so many lessons from this story. Well, the the story I that I I suppose that I, I is um, is less rich is the story of uh, um, everything that I'd been a part of up until then uh, was me and and my business partner had started it. This was the first time that we were involved with something where a third person was involved, uh, uh, and since Groupon, uh, uh, post Groupon. It went back to almost everything I've I've done has been either just me or me and and my and a business my business partner and that's been so three people I guess one lesson is three people is harder than two uh, and it's not just one third harder or you know it's exponentially harder for three people to agree than two people um, another lesson is this business started as the point dot com the point dot com was an idea around, uh, well, I'll make it easy. It was Kickstarter way before its time. And it was Kickstarter, but for, but for social action. I will do something contingent upon 100 people agreeing to do it with me, otherwise I won't do it. And it didn't work. We spent a lot of time building a website and theorizing about what would happen, and it ultimately went live. And like most websites and most businesses, um, expectations uh, were far under under met by reality. What was different about um, that is that we collectively did not throw in the towel and stop the business. What we did is pretty quickly acknowledge it was not working. The idea behind the point.com was not working what might work with a similar technology oriented approach? Well, one thing would be collective action around buying stuff. And Groupon was born reactively or iteratively versus miraculous conception. You know, Groupon is a story of iteration. And it then became a story, a fortuitous story where the experience, uh, be it of Media Bank, you know, now renamed Media Ocean in modern in the modern, you know, twenty twenty one, it's it's called Media Ocean, but Media Bank, uh, Echo, all these experiences we had had of growing businesses, fortuitously or materially became core to the operational execution of of growth. Not that the growth of Groupon was without lots of flaws and 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 sort of small failures but being able to start a, a calendar year with 124 employees and end that calendar year with 5100 employees is those are the facts that's what happened in tw in 2010 having that happen and uh at the same time having the train stay on the rails and continue to chug forward is only possible, I believe, if there's some conception of growth metrics, discipline, execution behind the wheel. Um, and so that's part of the Groupon story. There's a lot of stories of behind the Groupon story. We can go on for a long time, but that's the fun part about some of the, whether it's Amazon, I, I find a lot of guidance from Jeff and 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 some of Jeff's board members from the early days and hearing those stories. So I think all the stories of 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 this new breed in the last 30 years of companies that have been created and then the reflection that those companies have nearly replaced um uh 
those who 30 years ago dominated the Fortune 100, um, you know, or Fortune 10 or 20 for that matter. This is a great age in which to learn. And so these stories of, of Groupons or sales forces or whatever are, are ripe with lessons.